All right, guys, we're here with Gentry Jones. She is known as the Sober Single Mom on Instagram. She's got over 100,000 followers there. And on TikTok, she does funny dances on her coffee table. She's got her four boys, and she's a divorced single mom like many of us. Hi, Gentry. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? doing amazing i'm here in my garage slash studio and i just showed you a little bit around what's what's behind me what i'm looking at right here and it's it's uh, definitely a single car garage with all of ellie's trampoline and gymnastics stuff <laughs> right, how's your how's your studio your studio, studio looks a lot better than mine um it's okay if well i didn't show you the other side because the other side is the my son's like bedroom clothes so oh. there's like random shoes and socks and underwear over here so if we stick to this pretty wall over here then yeah it's good it looks very hgtv like um, oh yeah that's great so thanks for taking this call and i really or this interview excuse me and so i really wanted to talk about uh, i just want to dive right into it enough small talk we're past that uh <laughs> i want to dive into you know struggles you've had right so sober single mom right so uh, sobriety. I feel like that's a big topic uh, in your story that you've overcome, surpassed, you're, you're, you're managing and doing all those things and you help educate and show people your story uh, that it can be done and it can continually be mm -hmm. done. And mm -hmm. no matter what you have going on in your life, you can keep doing it. So could you, could you walk us through for people that don't know your, your story? A little over four years ago, I um, had hit a point in my drinking where I kind of had lost hope in ever being a non-drinker. Like I, I had been drinking and, and struggling with addiction off and on. Like I would do a little bit better and then I would stop for a while and do like kind of go back and forth from that like binge to like mellow. And I was on that roller coaster for a couple of years. And then um, a little over the four and a half years ago when I got sober on May 1st of 2018, um, I just had lost hope. I was like, I didn't think that I was going to be able to be a non-drinker. It was just like, this is just going to be my life. My kids are going to watch this train wreck. And it started to feel like there was no way out. And in that like feeling of there's no way out, it was when I was like, okay, I have to submit to sobriety. I felt like started to feel suicidal. I felt like I wanted to run away. I wanted to, I just, I, I had lost all hope and that's what finally gave me hope. Ironically, it's kind of an interesting concept, but yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And how old are your boys again? Um, 11 and nine. And then I have twins that are starting school tomorrow. So they're still here. If you hear them in the background and they're five. <laughs> <laughs> so they were little babies were, four and a half years they ago. Were, they were one and they had just turned one. I was sober on their birthday and I was really proud of myself for staying sober on their birthday party. And then the next day I started a binge and then, um, it was after that binge that I got sober. Gotcha. Okay. And so like, what do you, th what do you think? Thanks for sharing that first of all. And then, uh, what do you think got you? So like early on first, when you first started drinking m more in like the heavier realm of drinking, what, what do you think brought you to drink? Like what, why, why'd you drink? Let's ask that. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is a good question. I think that uh, one, I have a family history of addiction. Uh, my parents are both teachers. I have like a lot of really, I'm like very middle-class. Like they're teachers. I have a lot of aunts and uncles that are teachers, that coaches. Um, my grandma was a secretary. Like we're, we're just very like mellow, like middle of the road respectable yeah. people and there is some history of like addiction though um but there but the, the, i share that part because it's not like there's like trauma like it's not like i like a lot of people people think that like because you're an alcoholic you've come from a really bad house or you've been um exposed to like really extreme conditions and that's not the case like we had a couple cousins and stuff that had addiction issues and I got lucky enough to have it, but it's not just having like the different wiring of my brain, but alcohol also is like, you don't have to be a full blown like alcoholic to struggle with alcohol. Like it's an addictive substance that you're putting into your body. It's, it's chemically changing your brain. And so when you start drinking, especially when we started in high school, it starts to like alter your 
like developmental, like um, your development. Yeah, just alters your yeah. development. So um, in high school, I start drinking and I have a family history of kind of that addictive personality. And it just became such a crutch to to make excuses for being a certain way. So, like, I always was the outgoing kid, the fun, the crazy. And then I started getting called, like, annoying and too much and, and like, just felt like I didn't quite belong because I had such a bigger personality. And then you get alcohol and you get, like, an excuse to act like an like, asshole or whatever it is. You know what I mean? Right, like, it yeah, was an yeah. excuse. <laughs> And so at first it was like a safe place to be like, I can act silly and crazy and obnoxious and I can blame alcohol for it. Um, and then as I just kept drinking, it just became more of a crutch to just like numb. And I got pregnant really young and um, moved back home and just felt more and more trapped in motherhood. Um, I reconnected with my high school sweetheart, which was just like a safe, safe relationship. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I just kept playing it safe. And I felt like I was kept like dimming that bright light that I used to be. So even the alcohol at first was like a way for me to like tap into that bright light again. Mm -hmm. It became something that was like doling my bright light. And I, it became my only coping mechanism to like stop feeling trapped and, and stuck. It was just like, I just got to numb. I'm just going to numb out of this and deal with it later. Yeah. So Interest, a lot of interesting points in there. So you mentioned that you're very out, you were very outgoing and just kind of, you know, it seemed like, you know, high energy, outgoing, fun. And then slowly people started saying that was like too much, too extra. And so then you started drinking because it was an excuse almost to, to like be yourself almost, right? Like yeah. to, you're, call, you're saying, you're saying too much, too extra, annoying, all those things. Cause I think that those are the words that people were saying, but you were just really having fun doing your own thing, expressing yourself how you saw fit. And so it's interesting that the alcohol, I mean, it, it makes sense that the, it gives you the reason or it gives you the excuse, the security blanket of, Hey, they accept me better because oh, she's drinking. We're at a party. We're doing, you know, or we're doing whatever at a bonfire, and she's drunk, acting like gentry. That's just her because she's drunk. Not that's mm -hmm. her all the time, even though it might be. <laughs> so right, that's basically acceptance is what I'm hearing, right? So you're you're gonna be yourself, and you're accepted by your peers. Um, so that's a that's a very relatable thing for me, at least. Like you get to be yourself. This just gives you a reason of how to do it. Um, so that it, su it sucks. Like it hurts. And so that was early on. And then as you got older, cause you and I are very similar age. Uh, and so as you got older, what kind of kept you around the drinking, I suppose. Um, the, I think the freedom was always kind of like at first, I mean, like it's fun, it's freedom. It's, um, like I got to college and it was cool that we could just go drink and party and have fun. Um, I got alcohol poisoning in the first couple months of actually, it might've been the first month of college. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but then it, like shortly after I was out of my house or my parents' house, um, it kind of just went off the rails. So when I was in high school, I was like three sport athlete. I was an ASB. I was in like all the clubs. I was super, super busy and active. So it's not like I could drink and party all the time. And I had a certain standard I felt like I had to live up to. And then I go to college and nobody knows me and I'm not mm -hmm. playing sports. And it was just a lot easier to hide like the shit showness, like you could just, I could just keep it going all the time. And then that's what I did. And then I just got trapped in that. And, um, I did try to get sober at 21 and I put myself in rehab and, um, I stopped doing drugs at that time because I was mm -hmm. like smoking weed and doing cocaine because cocaine like keeps you going. Like it like sobers you up and gets you going again. And so right. I stopped doing drugs when I went to rehab, but then, um, I had my son, I got pregnant short after, shortly after pre rehab. And then when I had my son, I kind of thought like, Oh, I'm older. I'm more mature. I'm not in that party scene anymore. I, I can handle it now. And I, I mean, I, I could, and I couldn't, you know, like, it's like, I, I was able to, for a couple years 
kind of like fake it till I make it. Like I could kind of like, oh, I might have a bad night. And then I could kind of like, okay, I'm going to just like chill out for a little bit. But it was right. always a like balance, like always a struggle of like trying to not be a shit show, which I don't know if everybody feels that way when I'm drinking. No, I hear you. Yeah. Trying to, trying to do what you think is the right, the right move. Uh, that makes sense. And so what, so what made you at 21, that's a pretty wise decision. What made you enroll in rehab? Why, like, enroll. what was that? <laughs> enroll. I mean, I like you, <laughs> did I you like apply? <laughs> Got accepted? <laughs> like, please do you, have to, do you have to interview you have to interview for it like do they how does that look how do, what does rehab look like i know nothing about rehab right like i mean not nothing but like do you how does that look how do you do you accept I, I love, it? Is it like top I, top tier, I, <laughs> top yeah, tier like rehab? I um i love that enroll because it's actually that is kind of funny because it is a lot of people are like um referred there like they're because of like they got a DUI they got like they're losing their kids there's like a lot most of the people there were there because they were court ordered and I was just like <laughs> I'm <laughs> I just chose to come <laughs> I'm trying to better myself because I want to yeah. like, oh geez like <laughs> you you're one of those people I'm trying to better yourself get out of here yeah. uh so were they, is it, now I picture like the staff, like being shocked, almost like you're <laughs> voluntarily coming here. Like what the fuck? Dude. Like, who is this? Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Was it inpatient? Like you're there or during the day only or all, like you live there? I, I lived there for 21 days. Oh, how did, how were the beds? Mm -hmm. Not comfortable. And like the girl across from the hall was, uh, or my roommate was like detoxing. So she was like really grumpy oh, no. and it was, it was interesting. It was a good experience. I think the problem of going when you don't have any, when you haven't lost anything yet or you don't have the fear of losing anything. I mean, I think people should do it at that point. I think you should do it before you have to lose shit. But um, I think what was different is I kind of had this, like I'm better than these people vibe still. And sure. I, and I, I kind of felt like I'm just going just to get alcohol out of my system. Like I'm not as bad as you guys. Cause I haven't like got arrested. I haven't had it. Like, right. it's like, I, I really just thought it was going to be like a quick fix of like, if I could just stop drinking for 21 days, then I won't have to deal with like all the emotional bullshit that I've like in my head. That's making me drink. Like I, I just thought remove alcohol and I can just like carry on with the rest of my life. Like nothing happened. Yeah. And did that work? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's just what what made you fall back in, what made you fall back into it? Um so I I like I said I was like uh, got I got pregnant with my son what was that like right 6 months later. Yeah, like 6 okay. months after. So, um actually might not even been that much like 4 months. But anyways, I ha I have him. So I'm uh, and then I had to move back home. And that just kind of threw me back into old behaviors and old friend circles and that same like rut of high school in a way, like just kind of like these are the, what we do in our small town. And um, my now ex-husband had moved home also. And so we partied a lot in high school. And so we just kind of like picked up where we left off. What did your, yeah. what was that conversation with your parents? Hey mom, dad, do you have a, my room still available? Like, how, what was that? <laughs> yeah, babe, what's going on? What's uh, what what what's uh? Are you crying? Like, what's that? <laughs> like, what's, no, what's happening? What was that like? They were <laughs> disappointed. I, I think. No. I mean, like, they wouldn't have. They wouldn't probably say that. But they were like, they were, they were a little bit disappointed. That I wasn't originally. The plan wasn't to move home. The plan was to stay in Seattle. And cause that's where I was living at the time. I was over in Seattle. Yeah. So the plan was originally to stay there, but the um, relationship, it wasn't really like even a relationship that I was in. It was just like, it was like kind of dating, but not like a serious thing. And so it wasn't in like a good stable place. So I thought like, I'll just move home. My mom's raised three kids. She's going to be know what to do on how to help me. And it was just kind of an uh, original plan was just to kind of get on my feet. And then I'd go back to Seattle and go back to college. But and you, well, you, you, you eventually graduated, right? Yeah. So I went to I, I when I reconnected with my ex 
husband or my my high school sweetheart, we um, we moved out and got a little place in town, and um, <laughs> I went to college that about an hour from me, so I went to a different college and I just commuted. Gotcha. And you, so you mean because you have your degree and you, you have like your sort of your CPA license, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's and a so, big deal. All, <laughs> well, that's what I saw. So I, 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 I describe it as like, like being kind of overtaken by like poison ivy or something or like ivy. Like I kept trying to like fight my way out and it like kept like would grab my leg and then like pull me down and I'd like rip it off and start going again. Like it wasn't like if people think like people with addiction are just like weak and lazy and just like, don't, we don't care. And it's like, I was constantly fighting to try and get over it and to get better and to like better myself and going to college and then getting my CPA license. And those things always were really good distractions from the drinking. And as soon as I got my CPA license and I got a stable job, I feel like that's when the drinking got really bad again. Cause I didn't have any more like kind of goals on my horizon it was like all right i hit my last goal and now i'm just gonna sit at a desk and work the rest of my life and like what what do i do now with what now? Next. yeah what's that's next? what's next what a that's weird <laughs> <laughs> oh that's so funny right that's that's that's, that's kind of why i chose the name because it's such a common theme no matter your story right no matter if you're struggling mm. or you're successful or whatever it always seems to come down to like that question of like, Hey, well, well now what, like what's next? Um, mm -hmm. you know, and there's, there's times like there's seasons in everyone's lives, right. Where like, you don't necessarily have to be like constantly sprinting, striving towards this thing, right. The pace can kind of slow down. Um, but the, the common theme I see in, in people's lives who are, who are happy, um, successful in their own way, which success can be measured in so many ways. Uh, they typically have something they're working towards or a goal mm -hmm. uh, on some kind of front, right? Financial, career, fitness, family, relationships, a hobby, a thing, whatever, <laughs> like whatever right. it is. They're, they're, they're aiming towards something and they're, and they're working towards it. Now that's, that pace will change um, and, and the effort levels will change depending upon so many factors. But one thing you said that I, I love the analogy, I don't want to forget it, is is the poison ivy, right? You're working, I can just visually see it. So it's such a great mm -hmm. analogy. Uh, you're working towards this thing, you're walking, and then there's just like, it's like from like Harry Potter and from like <laughs> every movie out there, right? There's, no, I'm going to hang on to you. And it's like, ah, oh, get off me. And like, uh, or from like Jumanji, right? From Jumanji yeah, back in like the day. Very probably, Jumanji. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's exactly what it was. Um, that's the visual in my head, actually, Jumanji. Uh, that's, that's a great, because that's, that's a great reminder. If someone could, if every successful person or someone who's doing great things that, or that, or someone you look up to can say that, say that like, yeah, I'm running towards my goal. I'm sprinting this way and I'm doing all these great things, but oh boy, is there poison? I'd be pulling on my ankle, my arm, my neck. And like, you know, you're solving problems. You're getting past personal hurdles, external hurdles, mm -hmm. all these things. I, it's just a great analogy. I love that. So you got your CPA license. That's hard. That's super impressive. That's a lot of hours and time. So you, you finish college, you finish your CPA license, you're getting into like your life career. And now you're just like, boom, everything kind of slowed down. The sprint had slowed to a walk and then you kind of mm -hmm. fall back into old habits, which I can, I can understand that being kind of bored. Like what, like what, like what, mm -hmm. now what? So you fall back into your old ways of drinking, binging, however that looked for you. How did you pull yourself out of falling back in? Well, I got pregnant again. <laughs> like, hey, I'll save it, my that pregnancy. Can, that can be the catalyst. That's totally fine because some people don't, right? They'll get pregnant or they have a, 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 an opportunity to pull themselves out, let's say, and they, and they just don't, ex, you know, pull, they don't pull it off. How did that look? Yes. You got pregnant. So I... I I got pregnant with my second son and was like, all right, this is going to be it. And then started drinking again. Like, like all the things that people like think are like the big things that are going to stop you. Cause then I got a DUI and then that was going to be it. Like I got everything out of the house. Um, I worked really hard to get the DUI reduced. I, I quit drinking for five months and then just slipped into a, like just got caught up in a moment and then it just like took off again. And then I got 
pregnant with the twins and I was like, all right, this is going to be it. Cause I had just had a really bad summer of like blacking out and passing out at my high school reunion and just had like really, really bad moments. And so, um, when I got pregnant with the twins, I did, I started doing therapy. I started taking these a little bit more serious, but I was like, this is going to be like it. I can't start. I can't pick up again after this, after I have the twins. And then three weeks I wasn't, maybe it wasn't even three weeks, maybe been just two weeks after I had the twins, I, there was like my ex-husband drank and there was Corona in the house and I just like had a beer and it was, and then it was just like, I, at, once I had that beer a few weeks after having the twins, after being like so determined for those eight months that I wasn't going to drink, that's when like the hopelessness like really started to set in. Like, it was just like, this is just, I'm just so trapped. Like, I'm trapped as a mom. I can't like go anywhere or do anything. I'm trapped in the town. I'm trapped like in my job. I'm trapped in like everything just felt so mediocre to who I felt like I was supposed to be. And the only like coping mechanism that I had had for the last 10 years was to numb. And so when I had that hopelessness, I just numbed that whole year. And I'm really thankful nothing bad happened to the twins because there was uh, or any of my kids. I mean, there was there was lots of times I was drinking and driving with them. I passed out when I was like home alone with the twins, and um, just a really scary year. But when it hit that point, um, the one year later, where I felt suicidal, it, that's when it was like I I I have to do something. Like I have to do something. Like I, 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 it scared me what, what my kids' life would look like if I wasn't there. Like I was, it, um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I rambled so on the, that one. No, it's perfect. No, because it gets, mm -hmm. it, it lets your brain kind of process the whole question and get everything out. Mm -hmm. The last part that I heard that I think is hitting home is that the thought of not being with your kiddos, the thought of them not having a mom, was that, was that a pretty big driving factor to helping you kind of push you over, like to, to be so, sober? them not having a mom and then i had gotten caught drinking at work on this day too and not it's to up. say that like my kids <laughs> well not like fully they didn't know the extent of it like they didn't know i had vodka in my water bottle but they definitely knew right. that we were had drinking at lunch and i talked to like people that i'm working with about it about like the layers of accountability so like my kids like were young and I could kind of still trick them, you know, like, like, yeah, they were accountability and yeah, they deserved better, but I was still an alcoholic who could manipulate my kids into like not knowing exactly how bad I was or what was going on. And then I had like my close family that I could kind of like, they were another layer of accountability that kind of knew what was going on, but I could still kind of hide it. And then once it hit the, the layer of accountability of people that knew to people I worked with, it was like a little bit more, like I, I was, I was letting a lot more people down as I like, as more people knew. And when I got caught drinking with the twins, I had passed out in the car. My family had all come over and it was extremely like, the feeling was extremely like suffocating. Like I just felt so guilty and I felt so much shame. And I'm like, I can't, who am I? Like why, how, why can't I get this under control? But it wasn't as motivating at that time, because I was so consumed with like that self doubt, self hatred, self loathing until that moment when I was in the car where it, it was like, I, I got to let it go. Like I got to let it go. I got to let go of the fact that I made these poor decisions. I got to let go of the time I've wasted. Like I have to let it go because I will kill myself in the guilt and shame of what I'm doing. Yeah. That's a, that's a great point. I'm so glad you said it like that. That's, letting it go right it happened would you do it again probably not right like you know ideally not having to go through struggles it's just you know no right let's just say no but you gotta let it go right like step one you gotta move forward right so step one is like letting it go all right and step two is okay cool what's the what's the next direction we're going in okay let's decide mm -hmm. let's figure this out and let's let's try and go through you know this this door of opportunity to to leave that behind close the door so that's that's gr that's so great that you recognize that of like gotta let it go right because mm -hmm. there's things you know the question of do you regret stuff in your life right that people might ask anybody i always answer that question as like no because it makes you know i am who i am today and i have what i have because of what i've done and the decisions i've made you know would i do things differently perhaps but either way 
if you do regret something, this is anybody listening, if you regret something in the past uh, and it's holding you back, like it's a thick piece of ivy just hanging on to your ankle, you do have to let it go. You got to rip that piece of ivy off. Let it go. It's going to be there. Everyone knows about it. Got to mm-hmm. accept it, right? Accept it. Fall on your fall on your own sword. Press on. Okay. Cause life will happen in front of you. Like whether you like it or not, the next year is going to happen. The next five years, it's, it's going to happen. What are you going to do with your five years? Right. What are you gonna do with your mm-hmm. next year, your next day? And so now, even since you've been sober for so long, right. Is there still Ivy that comes up and like creeps up on you <laughs> a little bit? Well, Jumanji, <laughs> we locked that it's box. A great, it's in that... the basement. It's never coming out. <laughs> It's, do you hear that? You, you hear the beat in the ground? Like, what's that rumbling? I, I, I think yeah. I. Yeah, yes, and yes, but not to the extent that I uh, that I did when I first quit drinking. Um, I I think you just like start collecting so many different tools. Like you just like like letting things, learning to let things go, learning to just own who I am. Like, yep, I I passed out drunk with my kids in the backseat and we're all here today. Like we, it's done. It didn't like it happened. Um, right. And just learning to be like my mistakes. Like I like what you were just saying too, is that so many people will spend the next five years thinking about the last five years. Like they're so mm-hmm. consumed with like wanting to reflect on what they did wrong, that they're it's stealing their futures. And it's like, okay, I can let this keep stealing my future or I can, like really just let it go. And so um, learning that, learning to let things go, learning to find things that I'm really like passionate about and, and feel like purposeful with and like get, like I got back onto social media or I got on social media um, when I quit drinking and started doing like workout videos, like just posting what I was doing, posting things about my um, myself, like helps uh, personal development journey and just feeling so much more um, like like getting to use my creativity in that and like writing again and just finding those things that I used to really love doing as a kid where I didn't need alcohol. <laughs> I'm in a meeting. <laughs> what? But mom. Okay, that's fine. But when I get out, okay, bye. Go shut, shut the door. Go watch TV. I love you. Love you. Love you too. I feel like over the last four years, I've had a lot of growth in my coping mechanisms. And when you start drinking, your maturity like stops. And as much as like you would love to be look young and feel young and all those things, when your maturity is that young, it's really like it's overwhelming. So like you're, um, I was basically a 16 year old when I stopped drinking. I just like you, you have to kind of like catch up in your in your maturity and your emotional intelligence. And so I think over the last four years, just learning how to regulate my emotions better, learning how to de-stress better, learning how to, like I said, lean into like things that I'm passionate about and keep, keep goals on my to-do list always. Um, but if a craving comes up, it never, ever comes to a point where it even like remotely feels worth it. Yeah, no, that's, that's all great points. Um, that's that's it's interesting. So, uh, yeah, you mentioned one thing about like getting on social media. Did that help you by posting? And you're talking about sobriety. It sounds like did that actually help you since you're telling more people did that kind of help hold you accountable, knowing that people are looking, even though your audience that, you know, when you start a new account, it's always zero. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, did, did posting when you first start help or neutral or what do you think? Oh, well, yeah, I like the, those like layers of accountability that like you, yeah. you can only co-sign or people, the people closest to you are going to be the ones that will co-sign your bullshit. The farther out you go in that layer of accountability is you, you don't want, I didn't want to be down at the bar and I didn't want to post that I was 90 days sober and then go down to the bar and have somebody see me like drinking. So it was just another layer of accountability and not just like accountability for my sobriety, but just a um, accountability in other people's sobriety because people started reaching out to me and being like, I got sober and you're inspiring me. And it's like, if I give up, then they lose their inspiration. So it's, it's like, I, I felt, um, like a duty. 
I felt, yeah, yeah, like I, yeah, like I, it's, it, it felt like my purpose was to help them. I love that's so you, 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 you said it under your breath, such a great, like there's some great one liners. Uh, <laughs> the people closest to you will co sign your bullshit, and that's such a true. They'll, they'll, yeah, they'll, they'll sign it off like, ah, they'll, they'll write it off like, explain it away like, ah, it's okay, but someone who does not know you, like the internet, <laughs> they, <laughs> they are, they are classic internet people. They'll call it for exactly what they see it as if they have some, you know, yeah. troll account. Even the troll account sometimes will, will spit some comments that are like, I, well, they make a good point. <laughs> like, uh, okay. So that's a great, I love that line too. People close to you will co will co sign your bullshit. Uh, so you gotta, you gotta expand your network, expand who you're talking to in your community. That little, the layers of accountability. I like that concept. These are all great things. But this, is this from rehab? Where'd you get this from? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, if it was from rehab, maybe I would have stayed sober. I don't know if I got a lot from rehab. I, you know what? Actually, I do have a, my favorite one liner from rehab is the counselor throwing a pencil on the ground. Cause one, we were like, I, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying like, like poor me pity parties. And she's like, try to pick it up. You can't try. You're either going to do it or you're not. And I'm like, I love right. that. Cause People will do that. Like I, I've been trying as an excuse to fall back and not do something. Absolutely. I think people can do so much, right? The whole cliche of like, you can do anything you put your mind to, right? It's, it's, it's a cliche for a reason because it's very real. And once, when, once you've done something, uh, you know, it can be done and doesn't make it necessarily easier, but like, you know, it's possible. And now you know the steps, mm -hmm. excuse me. And so like it, you really can. I love that. But it's the attitude. Like, pick it up. Either you're doing it or you're not. What's your choice? Not? Cool. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying. It's yes or no. It's yes or yeah. no. You're either going to do it or not. Right? Uh, that's amazing. And so now, you're, now your social following is on Instagram over 100,000 or 110,000, something like that. And on, on TikTok, it's over 100,000 as well. Uh, now, what does that look like? Like, you, now you have a bigger, bigger <laughs> audience watching, probably reaching out for help too. What's the biggest positive you've seen from social media for you or for whatever you've seen? Um, I think that, Oh, I feel like there's so many positives. I know social media gets such a bad rap, but, um, for me, it's a creative outlet to be able to create content. Um, it's a way it's that of that bigger layer of accountability that, that I am here saying I'm sober. And so I don't want to let people down. And I think that you, as a, as a social media influencer, you're constantly having like a mirror held up to you, and you get to decide like what people are saying is true and what's not. So you like, you you gain a lot of confidence posting because, like you said, like the trolls will say something, and if it like, ooh, that that bothered me. Why did that bother me? So you, there's just so many opportunities to grow in yourself and in your confidence. You're constantly having people make comments about you, and you get to decide if they're true or not. And if it, if I don't believe it's true, it just like is another like chink in my armor that I'm like, no, I, I am who I think I am. And, or it's something that's like, you know what? You're right. I probably should work on that. Now, yeah. A little self-reflection. There's a, there was a video I watched. It's like a, of a, of some kind of speech at a conference or whatever. And the speaker was uh, talking to the crowd directly to individuals. And he was saying, he was trying to drive home a point uh, and he was making fun of each individual to make a point. And what he was making fun of them about, uh, was, oh, Hey, you have blue hair. I don't like blue hair. And the person he's talking to has like brown hair, blonde hair, red hair, whatever. And then he points to the next person. Oh, you got blue hair too. Oh, I don't like you, man. You're stupid because you got blue hair. And he did it to like three or four people. And he asked them like, Hey, did my hate, my hurtful comment did that make you feel bad? And they're like, well, no, I don't have blue hair. So it doesn't really affect me. And so the same thing can be applied to when someone says, Hey, you're, you're a bad, this a bad that, like you're doing it wrong. If you know yourself and you know yourself well, you know that like, that's not me. doesn't even affect me to the same extent. If someone mm -hmm. says you are dumb because you have blue hair and you have brown hair, mm -hmm. you're like, that doesn't, that, that's so off point. That's so off mark, off the mark. Like, and so if someone says, you know, you're a bad mom or you're a bad dad or you're a this or you're a that and you know it not to be true, it should have the same effect as the blue hair comment. And so mm -hmm. to your point, I, th I like that. that. That analogy for me helps me helps me ass assess those like troll comments or, or whoever, like, why does this bother me? 
is this really me? And if it's not, understand that, like reiterate it and then press on. And next time I see that comment ever again or similar, I know it's just, I don't have blue hair. I don't have blue hair. <laughs> That's not me. Mm -hmm. I don't have any other questions lined up for you. I, I, I love to ask if you have questions for me or if something has come up. Oh, for you. This is a job interview. Where's your question? Where's your <laughs> questions at? I know you're supposed to always be prepared for a question. Back. No, I, I, I really appreciate you and your content and our like friendship because I feel like even just a year ago when we like first met and we were like, um, like became friends and talking about like content and stuff, it was, yeah. I feel like I, I still was having this like chip on my shoulder about things a little bit. Like, like, Oh, well it's harder for me cause I got four kids or it's harder for me cause I have this or it's like, Oh yeah, well that's, it's different for this or that. And it's like, you set such a good example of like, you don't even like compare to if it's easier or harder to somebody next to you. Like you just say like, focus on like, this is what I'm doing. This is like, I'm just going to work on this and you have like such a good level response to things that, um, I mean, I always feel like I learned something when you're going through your comments or you're going through your stuff. Cause I used to be super reactive to people saying things about me or, super like get down and be, when I'm overwhelmed and it's like, mm, or I'll just pick up where I left off tomorrow. And like, we'll just keep going. It's not that big of a deal. And I, and I don't feel like I call out like the hate comments as much anymore because it's just like, if I give it attention, then, then I'm giving it like my time and I don't want to do that. Yeah. And I think you set a really good example of that. Yeah. No, thank you for that. It depends on the hate comment, but like there's usually not like a, a net positive for, for a response. There's times where I will where I will respond knowing I'll never change the person's mind that's commenting. And that's not like the goal by any means. But the way in which I respond to certain comments, I know other people who are scrolling the comments will will see that and they'll gain something of value for themselves, like another penny of deposit into the trust account. Right. <laughs> like I love these. I love analogies. <laughs> They're so like good. Like. <laughs> <laughs> like to build trust, you can build, takes years to build trust, but it takes like a moment to lose it. Right. I think there's like a Warren Buffett saying quote in there somewhere, uh, you know, take that to the bank and deposit it. Right. Each, each, each act of goodwill and trust, it's like relationships too, or each, each act of goodwill and, and, mm -hmm. and faith is, you know, it's pennies. You're depositing pennies in your bank account. You're saving them up. And if you ever have to use, you know, withdraw from that account, Oh boy, is it expensive, right? You have one mistrust where like you lose someone's trust or you act a certain way. You're not pulling out pennies. You're pulling out tens of dollars. Oh boy, is it hard mm -hmm. to earn that, build that bank back up. Right. And so that's, that's how I look at a lot of things is it's, you're just doing penny deposits on who you are, right? Like you're not like trying to, yeah, you're just, you're just being yourself and keep picking up that pencil off the ground. Either you're doing it or you're not like, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. Either do it or you're not. Either do it or not. Like, get off the pot. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, I get a lot of people in my DMs. Well, I get a lot of people in my DMs that like. Hey but I get a lot of people. <laughs> I get a lot of people in my DMs that say that. Like, I'm trying. I'm trying, and it's just like that. Try, like that. Try. The word try is what holds me back. Like, you're either gonna do it or you're not, and you gotta let go of what's what's happened. But I so say, yeah, that's definitely one I use all the time. Yeah. And for the people that are saying that, that's a good point. They're, they're saying they're trying. Some people are just saying it. Some people are actually trying. And, and so if you are one of those pe people who are going through something or you're either you're going through something or you're trying to reach a goal, right? You, you can either be trying to get yourself out of a rut or you've already gotten out of the rut and you're moving towards something successful in your own way. Uh, if you're trying and trying and trying, and you're taking legitimate steps towards that door of opportunity and you're walking through it and you're doing the things you're supposed to be doing and it's still not clicking or it's still that's not working. Like I keep doing what you're doing. Try this. Then it work. Try that. And as long as you can honestly say that you're, you're giving it a, a true honest effort on each of those things you're doing, you know, say for, say for real estate, I get asked that question a lot with like flipping houses and, and stuff like that. I tried to learn it. Well, let's, you know, let's dive into it. What is, what is your try? Well, I read this and I stopped. Ah, 
ha, uh, I don't think you're there yet, right? Like you tried to the level you're thinking, let's try a little harder or at least go down the path a little bit further until you hit an actual mm -hmm. hurdle or roadblock. Um, and then ask yourself, why is that a roadblock? Yeah, if you're just, if you just say you're trying, find a, keep, keep attempting real legitimate attempts. Yeah, and I, and I think that what you're explaining though is like they, it's not necessarily even like they're trying, they're doing and then like, oh, that's not working. I'm doing this and then that's it, but that didn't work. But they're still doing, they're not, right. they're not using that try as like. Yeah, I tried. And so what are you doing is. now? Uh, yeah. Nothing. <laughs> like why what like <laughs> all day like nothing there's seasons i get it but like if you're not yeah yeah like different my different different speeds it's all good i love that you're here thanks for taking this call now is your chance to plug your get, give yourself a plug what's your your instagram handle where can they find you where can they give you money what can you sell what do you got <laughs> <laughs> can they give me money? Hmm. Um, okay, so my Instagram is at Life with Gentry. My TikTok's at Life with Gentry. Um, I do one on one uh, life and recovery coaching. So, um, recovery coaching obviously is like surrounded around alcohol, but I also will help a lot of people that are just trying to set goals and take turn that try into do. What else am I doing? What else do I have got going you on? Got some, you got some merch. Uh, you got some AF squared stuff, right? Still or no? Oh, yeah, I got some alcohol free AF uh, merch. Um, and then I'm doing a course, personal development course that's going to come out in the next month or two. So if nice. you go to my page, um, there's like information on that on my website. Yep. Perfect. Sweet. Y'all heard it here. Life at Gentry on Instagram and on TikTok. Gentry is G E N T R Y. Life at Gentry. Uh, Life with Gentry. Life, oh dang life with gentry if you <laughs> life with gentry that's what i said shoot <laughs> thanks for that go give her money learn something from her all the things if you need a cpa she's got the accreditation <laughs> she's that's all i got i well, appreciate it thanks for your time gentry yeah thanks for having me all right i'll see you later